Thank you for downloading Season 6, Episode 3 of Baseball Pitching the Fix. I am your host, Joe Janish, and with me, as always, is baseball pitching motion expert, Angel Borelli. And we have a big show for you today. We are going to start off with our MLB segment, which will be about when good pitchers go bad. And in our teaching moment, we will be troubleshooting velocity and specifically in regard to the pelvis and trunk rotation. And then in our final segment in the pearls, we are going to see if you really can keep your feet on the ground while reaching for the stars. So without further ado, I will welcome our fantastic baseball pitching motion expert, Angel Borelli to the mic. Angel, <laughs> how are we doing today? Oh, uh, we're doing great. Isn't Joe entertaining everyone? <laughs> uh, they should know the real truth <laughs> because you keep it so serious on the show. We've been laughing for the last 15 minutes. So anyway, we're going to have fun today. We've got some great topics. I'm so excited and thank you all for listening. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, because I, I need to really annoy our listeners, I'm going to talk again this week about a picture from the New York Mets. I just can't, I cannot keep myself away from <laughs> this organization where they seem to have so many injury issues, or maybe it's just the fact that I'm close to it. Maybe every major league team has issues like this, but I, I find it hard to believe. So in our segment, when good pitchers go bad, we're going to talk today about Jacob deGrom, who anyone who follows baseball or hasn't been under a rock for the last few years knows that Jacob deGrom had one of the most memorable, fantastic seasons of any pitcher in Major League history last year. He, he I, I think he had the lowest ERA since maybe Ron Guidry in 1978. And even though his one loss record didn't really explain how great a season he had, he still won the Cy Young Award on a team that really should have given him more support and done a lot better. But in any case, he was probably if not the best pitcher on the planet, one of the best three pitchers on the planet last year. And, and and I don't think there's any argument about that. Now, fast forward to this year in his first few outings. Well, actually his first outing was pretty decent, but his last two outings were not Jacob deGrom-like by any stretch of the imagination. He was giving up a lot of hits. He was giving up the long ball. I think he's already given up five home runs. I watched a little bit of what he was doing and he definitely was not the DeGrom that I remember. He's when I watch, I love to watch Jacob DeGrom, even though I don't really like the Mets. I like to watch DeGrom just because of the way he pitches. He just paints the corners and, and puts the ball exactly where he wants to. And he is not doing that this year. His velocity is still there. It's around 96, 97 plus. But his location is not where it usually is. And and there's a big difference between location and control when it comes to like balls and strikes and, and walks and strikeouts and that sort of thing. And, and location is hitting the right spots. And he was pitching so poorly that that even Alex Rodriguez, who was doing color commentary for somebody, he even mentioned, oh, I, maybe he's tipping his pitches. But that's not what I saw. I just saw a guy who was not hitting his spots. So lo and behold, we find out that Jacob deGrom is experiencing some elbow soreness. Well, as anyone who's listened to this show for the last five years knows that if someone has elbow soreness it, or a problem with their elbow, it could possibly affect command. Isn't that right, Angel? That's absolutely right. All right. So as it turns out, they decide to put Jacob deGrom on the injured reserve list. And then they schedule him for a doctor appointment and to uh, for an MRI. So what does Jacob deGrom do next? He throws from 120 feet, long tosses, and says he's not going for the MRI because he's feeling just fine out of the blue. Well, <laughs> I read a couple articles on this and I shared a few of them with Angel. And, and I, I just wanted to go through with you, Angel, some of the things that were mentioned in the articles and see if it lines up with what someone should be doing when they're experiencing problems with their control and also have elbow soreness. All right. So first off, I, I mentioned that even though he was scheduled to see the doctor, he decided he was going to do some long toss from 120 feet. I have always been under the impression that long toss can put more of a strain on your elbow. So you probably wouldn't want to do that if you were having some discomfort. 
Am I right about that, Angel? Well, yes. And the caveat to that is, so what it sounds like to me is he is a pitcher who goes out that far all the time when he plays catch. Okay. Also, whenever a pitcher goes out that far when he plays catch, and of course, some of them go way out further, and 120 feet is where, where, where forces do start to creep up on you, increase forces. Under that, not so much. But every pitcher, I don't care who they are, they always start at 45 feet, back up to 60, they go to 90. So when he, so his arrival at 120 and his knowledge that he felt okay, you know, it wasn't like jumping off the end of a diving board, not knowing how deep the water is. He, you know, he obviously decided I'm going to throw today and see. And if I remember correctly, he wasn't concerned because the place that he didn't think it was an important spot in terms of where the elbow hurt. And since he has is a, is a post Tommy John surgery guy, he knows a lot about the elbow. So, He's, he went out to throw to see if he's okay. It's very hard to keep pitchers from doing this because they, they think they know their body. They don't want to go on the DL. And sometimes the way I look at it is if a pitcher says to me, can I throw, can I throw? That's kind of a sign that, oh, you mustn't be hurting because when pitchers are hurting, I mean, really hurting, they don't want to throw unless they're crazy. The shoulder They'll throw through that sometimes, but usually the elbow shuts them down. So depending on where the soreness is. So, but normally I, if I were there and we're like, we're throwing a whole Hail Mary right now, no pun intended, or we're throwing a Hail Mary. We want you to get through today. Let's stay at 60 feet because if he's a pitcher who's had pain, and let's say it's not a big deal. And for all you coaches, you know, there are things that come up and a pitcher says, no, I think I'm okay. I know it. I know I came off the mound, but no, I feel okay. When you say, okay, let's test this. The first part of his next week or so of throwing, you would want to keep him at 60 feet because guess what? That's his job is to throw it from 60 feet. So, while you're in that tenuous phase, let him only throw from 60. And if he's good, then you can keep on going and get him on the mound. But don't take him to a distance that's unnecessary, plus is risky. So that's a, a kind of a complete answer to your question, Joe. The experimental throwing session should not have been beyond 60, ideally, because he ran the risk. But he was somebody, if he does it all the time, he's probably, in his head, he's saying, I want to see if I can do everything I usually do. And the other thing is, guys that throw at a certain distance as part of their habit, they think that it has an effect on the way they perform, and they don't like to let things go that help them. So, uh, I mean, he didn't like say, let me take a gun to my head. But even though someone else might look at it like that, he thought he was being OK. And he must have been OK to let himself back up to that. But ideally, coaches, you when you're experimenting and you're in that phase where you're crossing your fingers with a pitcher, don't have him do anything that's crazy. Have him do what he needs to do so that because that's where he really needs to be good. OK. No, that makes sense to me. Now, you, you touched on another question that I have for you, something that he mentioned. He And I'm going to read a direct quote from Jake DeGrom. He said, I've had Tommy John before and done those tests and everything feels fine with that. I'm not really worried about the spot it's in. It's just more being smart and not trying to do too much too early and risk a more serious injury. So Jacob DeGrom had Tommy John surgery in 2010. So that's yeah, almost 10 years ago, eight, nine years ago. So even though he's had Tommy John before and he's had an injury before, I mean, isn't it possible that he could have pain somewhere else in his elbow or soreness somewhere else in his elbow that could be a risk factor for him for a more serious injury than just being a little sore? When he was talking about the injury, uh, and I, I was listening, but I did, he, did he use the word elbow? That, that they had pain in his elbow. Did he ever say that or did he say arm or did he say? This is exactly what he said. And this, this is another part of my question too, because he was kind of 
trying to blame the pain on strep throat. I mean, I've had strep throat. I've had strep throat during baseball season. He said it was just a little sore in re- in reference to his elbow. I had been sick, kind of had a whole body soreness. For me, when I don't throw, it, it seems that things pop up. I wasn't on a normal routine. I was trying to just get enough in to be able to make my starts, and I just felt a little soreness in my elbow. I decided to say something. Now, we, it's good that he said something because we want pitchers to say things, but this is a guy who, who doesn't ever say anything because he's such a competitor. And honestly, like, like I said, I've had strep throat. It doesn't make your elbow sore. Like you feel achy, but I mean, kind of a, a strange thing to say. I, I kind of sounds like he might be trying to hide something, but I, I, let's not go there. Let's just stick to the uh, focus on, you know, the, if, if he, if he's had pain before that led to Tommy John surgery, isn't it possible that he could have, could have pain in a different place and still have his UCL at risk or maybe something else? Well, whenever, first of all, he had it a long time ago and, you know, so he's got a lot of scar tissue in there. I don't know how uh, the the condition of his muscles are. The thing here that's, that I would be concerned about, and that's really why we're discussing this, like how would we all proceed if we had a pitcher that was so good and then all of a sudden things start mounting up, first bad performance and then possible pain then no MRI. And isn't my understanding that he said no to the MRI, but now he's agreed to one or he had one recently. So he did follow, they did follow this up with an MRI. Yes. Okay. So that's, that's, a, you know, that's giving us, cause you know, we have to also assume we're not getting all the information. Right. Um, let me ask you a question. I know you're talking about the season, which just got underway a month ago, but how, do you know how he did in spring training? You know, off the top of my head, I, I really I haven't even been paying attention, so I don't know. So, you know, I, I think what we're hearing here, and this is something for all coaches to pay close attention to, because you want to kind of have, you have to be masters at connecting the dots. When you've got pitchers that are valuable to you, you know, like let's say you're in a college program and, you know, you've got your number one guy or your number two guy. And it's like, oh, no, don't tell me something's going on. Or if you're in the minor league professional system and you see something go wrong. Here's the thing. This, this little combination of things that are happening here, as confusing as they sound, they all kind of make sense in a way. They make sense in a way where when a scenario like this starts, before it gets this complicated, you want to have the your flags up and your red lights flashing so that you start addressing it immediately. So what's the most telling thing about this for me is that this is a pitcher who did so well last year and now he's showing some sort of uh, decrement. Is this been, I'm, are people actually saying what you're saying, Joe, that it's not just a pitcher who had a bad outing. This He just doesn't isn't pitching the same way. I think I'm the only one who's coming out publicly to say it. Okay. But it's something that you guys there where, where you live, I mean, the people are saying, yeah. So here's, here's the thing. When a pitcher who is good starts to go bad, he starts to not look like himself. He's got maybe the velocities there, but the location's not there. And you know, location is everything. And a power pitcher is going to try to power through everything. But when location starts to change, that's part of their little component, the way they locate when they're throwing hard. You want to always start right there to take a look at what's he doing differently. And, you know, this is where, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I mean, if I would ask the MLB and schools to start going in a direction, you know, everybody this year in the major leagues, there, everybody's relying on statistics and spin rate and science. And 10 years ago, when I was talking science, people didn't really want to even hear the word science. Now, since Moneyball, we've got, okay, now let's bring in unusual people to do unusual things. So now we've got the spin rate. Then we've got the, the flight of the ball. Now we've got the exit velocity. We've got all this stuff going on. So I think there is a chance that if we keep talking about it, maybe somebody will say, hey, let's bring science in on a level of somebody who can, here's our pitcher, he's really good, he was really good last year, all of a sudden, two outings in a row, he's not himself, can can you please take a look at his video from this game 
and his video from last year, the last game he pitched, and can you see where there's differences? So that's what you do when you start scratching your head saying he doesn't look like himself. Then let's say you don't do that, but then let's say on top of that, he comes to you and says, my elbow's hurting. Now here's something you don't want to hear out of a guy who's already had surgery because you don't know if this means his surgery is breaking down. You know, did something happen? Did he hurt it? And now it's compromising the actual surgery. You don't know anything. Here again, you can say to somebody who does like something, I, you know, what I do, a troubleshooter who really understands mechanics. And I'm not talking about measuring things. I'm talking about looking at the pitcher in the qualitative way that you coaches do when you're looking at his pitching. I'm looking at his pitching motion the way you look at the balls around the plate. Then you get somebody who looks and says, okay, he's got some pain in his elbow. Is he doing any of the motion things that actually contribute to that? No, 100% that when a pitcher has pain somewhere, somebody with my background, when I look at it, I can see immediately what he's doing. And if you have, if this is happening with a pitcher who's been pitching and not in pain, That's so simple because all you have to do is compare release points, the way his arm looks at release, the way his body's turning, et cetera. You can pick it up right away. When you get on top of it like this, it never gets this far. So my message is when a pitcher has this kind of scenario, it's complicated for Jacob right now because it's gone on and there's been some, something missed here. And now we don't know really what's going on, but, The truth is, is that we don't want to let situations get this far because we don't want the pitcher in this position, especially when, when he signed, didn't he have an MRI during signing like a a month or two months ago? Didn't he sign a new contract? Yeah. And that was, that was another thing I wanted to ask you about. So he had an MRI probably about three weeks ago before he signed this big contract. And one of the reasons that he thought he didn't need another MRI was because he just had one in, you know, three weeks ago. But isn't it possible that either something wasn't caught on the first MRI or isn't it possible that something could have happened in the three weeks since that could have popped up on MRI? I mean, I've had MRIs and, and there's, I know there are different kinds and I, I who knows whether it was, you know, a, a regular routine MRI that he had, or if they did a, a, is it called a contrast MRI where it's a little more in depth or? Yes. Well, when somebody's had surgery, they, they, they don't always, first of all, unless somebody on a routine MRI to clear a player for playing, they're not going to do a contrast MRI because contrast MRIs, which are the very, uh, you know, accurate, they, they hurt because you put a needle in and then the pitcher has to recover from that. So they hope that they can see everything, but because he wasn't presenting with any complaints, they weren't doing investigation of soreness. They were just double checking. But the other thing is, and I'm pretty sure that I remember hearing this at the ASMI conferences I attend and surgeons talk when somebody's had Tommy John surgery, they already know uh, that I think dye doesn't really help because that whole, the whole elbow, it can have, uh, it can have scar tissue. In other words, their tissue isn't exactly the same as a normal elbow. So things might not show up, but in either case, in answer to your first question, yes, there could have been something there, but he wasn't presenting with symptoms. Yes, something could have happened after that, especially when you tell me that after that moment coincided with all of a sudden he can't locate. And the only thing that's curious to me is you told me his velocity is not down. No. So what that tells me is that tells me more that he may be having a shoulder, something going on in his shoulder that is not keeping him from throwing hard, but from keeping stable, staying stabilized. He could have a stabilization problem through his elbow so that his hand isn't. Remember, location problems are always something that's going on at the last moment. They're, the fingers in the wrist and the forearm positioning isn't exactly the way the pitcher wants it to be. And so if there's a stabilization problem with that, 
that will cause location problems, not necessarily uh, velocity problems. And if his shoulder's 100%, he won't have velocity problems. If he starts to have a decrement in his velocity, then I would just take a look at the whole complex, which is, of course, what they're doing anyway. Whenever we have elbow forearm, we want to look to see if the shoulder's doing its job. So, and again, it depends on the location of the pain as to what kind of injury it is. And here's the other thing that I want to remind coaches of. If you ever start to think, that somebody who does the work I do could be valuable to your team. We in science can connect up the location of the pain to where the problem is in the motion. So if Jacob all of a sudden is having something in the back of his elbow and now he's missing, that's the simplest thing. You know up front what you're going to be looking for, and then you go in and you look. It's sort of like having you know, experienced detectives on your side. That is what somebody who does qualitative analysis or, you know, especially myself, because I've been doing it for so long, we're not going in blind. So I think that I would love Major League to have the staff people that could have prevented all this from getting so far with Jacob. And I know the Mets have been sort of creative in the past, but I, you know, this is a, a system they can have in place to where the second you know, the second a pitcher's having trouble, he can go to this person and say, hey, would you take a look at, do you see anything? My curveball, I couldn't locate it for anything. Those are the calls I get from my pitchers. They send me video. They say, Angel, my last outing, something's wrong. My changeup was so bad. And they're not complaining of pain. They just know that it felt weird. And it wasn't just a miss. Something is wrong. And you know what? Over the phone, we solve it. So that's where MLB wants to go. The take-home message from this scenario with Jacob is that we all, in baseball, we need to avoid this kind of situation because it doesn't turn out real well most of the time. So we'll all keep our fingers crossed for him. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I just have one more question because there were a lot of different things in this Jacob DeGrom scenario. I just have one more question that I wanted to throw at you. There was one thing that he said that struck me because I I know I've ex- heard this before and, and seen it before in print from, with other pitchers. When he had the elbow soreness and then he decided that his arm felt fine, he said, it goes back to the throwing thing for me. I feel better when I throw. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, I've heard this before. Pitchers say that they have pain or they have soreness, or they're not feeling right, and then they throw, and they feel better. Is this motion is lotion, or is it, or is there something more to this? Well, on a physiological level, it, you know, if somebody's having pain, what you hope it is, is it's a muscular thing. And when you have a muscular thing, it's really a tendon thing. And the muscle, the tendons are the way the muscle attaches to the bone. The ligaments, you know, the things he had operated, they're deep inside the body. They're connecting bone to bone. So most of us, when we walk around and we say, oh, my shoulder hurts, oh, my arm hurts, what we're we're really feeling many times is that there's a tendon that's not doing okay. And especially if if this is involved, like, of course, I'm in the gym all the time and, of course, working with pitchers. So whenever you're using your body in a sport way, the tendon is usually affected and it's usually involved when there is some sort of injury or unusual soreness going on. Tendons love when they're warmed up. So, in fact, the first question I ask somebody when they say they're hurting is I say, When you throw, does it get better the further back you go? And they go, yes. In fact, I'll start and I'll be like, oh, my God, something's wrong again. It felt like this when I finished pitching the other day. And then I'll start playing catch and it'll feel really good. That tells me that they have a tendon injury. It may not be the full story, but that's part of the story. Then, but a lot of times they get on the mound then and try to throw and pitch, which is different than flat ground throwing, and they may have a problem. But that's kind of physiologically an accurate statement if someone is having a tendon problem. And yes, whenever we're, you know, if you're sore from training, like, you know, I I train all the time, and, and you can feel sore as you enter the gym. 
And then you feel better because you've had blood flow. And remember, everybody, blood flow, that's why we do warm-ups. That's why we recover correctly. That's why I'm a proponent of pitcher's training. Blood flow helps enhance healing. So he's feeling better when he has more blood flow. I would be looking at tendons if we want to take this message seriously and or if it's not serious, it's just that he, you know, he feels better when he's not rusty. So, yeah, there's a lot of unanswered questions here and the right detective asking the right questions can get to the bottom of it. But the fact he did go and have an MRI, either the team got on him, the owners, which is which makes sense. But, yeah, you do want to get to the bottom of it because he's a valuable guy and this is his future. And we want to protect him even when he's not able to protect himself. Right. Yeah. And I think, it, I mean, it just made sense to do the MRI because, I mean, why not? You, you can do it. You know, it's, it's not a cost thing for, for an MLB player. All right. I think we've talked enough about Jacob deGrom. Let's move into the teaching moment where we are going to be troubleshooting velocity with the pelvis and trunk rotation. Can you take it away? Yes. So uh, we started in the last episode. I, I love giving you tips, uh, uh, coaches, and also for pitchers who can, you know, take a look at their own self on how to, when you're, when you're looking at a pitcher or someone, how can you look to see, is he, is he doing something that's inhibiting his own ability to produce his top velocity. And, you know, when someone comes to me and they want to throw harder, I always don't, I don't think, oh, I've got to add something in to his motion. I always think I've got to remove something or clean something up that he's already doing, especially when you see a guy who you know should be throwing harder and he's not throwing harder. Or if you start to see you know, he was throwing harder last month and this week his velocity is going down. So last week we talked about the rear leg, you know, some of the flaws with it. And this time I want to talk about probably one of the most important things in regard to velocity, the true way that velocity is developed in the body as the segments are moving from the ground up is through the rotation of the pelvis and the trunk muscles. And those forces are transmitted then into the shoulder, the elbow, and then finally into the wrist. And the initiation of that uh, sequence that I just described starts with the pelvis. And the pelvis is the rectangular bone that, and I've said this before, if you had a pair of jeans on, It would be pocket to pocket in the front. It's like a rectangular bone. And up into that, the hip joints, the legs insert. So it's sort of a rectangle with two legs. And the legs are separate from it. And the pelvis is the part of the body that once the foot lands, the pelvis starts the rotation. And then the next sequence is, Uh, In science, they just call it the upper trunk, but I call it, you know, I go lower trunk, upper trunk. I like to keep it a little separate where we've got the pelvis, which would take part of your belt line with it. And then right above the belt line up to about your, you know, chest level. And then you've got the third level that actually brings the arm around. That's the sequence. And the most important part of that sequence of action is that you begin it correctly. And because the pelvis, it's just like some of you may be going, what's the pelvis? It's not like a term that unless you do body work or unless you're a chiropractor or we're in the medical field, you don't talk about that. But it is a critical piece of the rotational sequence where energy is actually transferred, ending up into the hand. So velocity is produced by the segments moving, and each segment has to move to its peak velocity before the next one can move at its peak velocity. So if you don't have correct pelvic movement, you are going to not have correct rotation. So before we go any further, everyone knows I now have a YouTube channel. So when you get to your devices or you're on your phone right now, take a look at the video that is up for this segment. And Joe, have you got got it up so that we can be you can be looking at it as well? I sure do. I'm looking at it right now. 
Okie dokie. So I asked one of my guinea pig pitchers, my poor pitchers, they are exposed to the craziest things <laughs> to help me teach. But anyway, so I have a very simple thing. I asked one of my pitchers to just lay down and he's got, his, as you can see, his feet together because I wanted to demonstrate what pure pelvic rotation looks like. Now, it's not pure in the sense that we don't see some waistline muscles moving. But what you're going to notice is, so imagine he had jeans on and you see two pockets and they are moving back and forth. He is a right-handed pitcher. So obviously when he goes, when he rotates his pelvic to the left, you can actually see that he does that better than when he rotates to the right. So just to, just to bring your eyes into focus on the pitching motion, the pitcher steps out and he lands. And when he lands, his pelvis, if he's got really good range of motion, would be flat to the ground the way this pitcher is if you stop the video when he's actually on the ground before he rotates. So, so you can stop the video when he's flat. That's the way you would want the pelvis to look or close to that when the pitcher lands. And then when he lands then as a right-handed pitcher, the right side of his pelvis will start to rotate just like it's doing. You can turn the video on again, just like it's doing in this video. It rotates around the left hip joint. Then the next piece that happens is the trunk. And the next piece that happens is the upper body. The most important thing is that this pelvic rotation begin. Now, the way this ties in with the way this ties in with what we talked about last week, this is why I wanted to bring this into the, the series on troubleshooting velocity, is that we talked about the importance of getting to the front leg. We've talked many times about where the front leg lands. So as you see this pelvic pelvis rotate, notice it's rotating very easily because he's in alignment. If a right-handed pitcher starts uh, to step too far to his right, so he's crossing over his body, and it's what you coaches call throwing across the body. I don't. I never understood that term because he's stepping across his body. So the if he steps across his body when he starts this rotation, when the right side of the pelvis starts to do what you see it doing in this video, he will not be able to completely rotate the pelvis. And then the, uh, the trunk and the arm will get ahead of the pelvis. And then you'll have a pitcher who is using incomplete rotation. Usually he's going to lead with the elbow. It affects the way the ball is released. So what has to happen is the pelvis has to begin the movement, just like you're seeing in the video, then it continues onward to come completely facing the target as the trunk is also rotating and as the arm is coming into position. And then, of course, you know we're at that what we call max external rotation position. The pitcher is completely squared up to the target. Now, none of this can happen if the pelvis doesn't initiate and if it doesn't continue going, so the trunk comes next and the arm comes last. The worst thing that could happen is that the arm segment gets ahead. So what you want to do, coaches, is you want to look at this pelvic motion. You want to teach pitchers this motion. And then when they start their, when their stride lands, you should see this motion happening. And just like when you see this pitcher, he's doing... When he's moving, you can see how it starts to stretch through his trunk. That is exactly the way the trunk is pulling. And you see his arm is staying down on the ground. You're going to get an excessive visual of that full motion there. So now this is a way. And the, the most important thing is when you see his arm come around, it should be behind the pelvis. Just like when he's doing the little drill here, you see that his arm is staying behind. That's exactly how it is in pitching, and that's how you get the right pre-stretch. But if you're standing on that angle where you can see if his arm is ahead of his pelvis, in other words, his pelvis hasn't squared up, 
before the arm arrives, and you'll actually see it where it's excessive, where there will be arm ready to deliver and the pelvis hasn't rotated. Then you know he either didn't know how to rotate his pelvis or he's stepping in the wrong place so it's blocking his rotation or from the errors I talked about last week, he's doing one of those things which didn't allow him to actually even get his body weight into his pelvis so that he could actually turn. So this is the most important thing about rotation. Now, Joe, does that make sense to you? Yeah, um, it it doesn't look like a whole lot of movement. It's, it just looks like something that's uh, more of a technique thing than anything else. Yes. So let me say one more thing about the pelvic rotation. So you'll notice on this that he can't really get any further into rotation. And the reason is, this is why I had him do it this way, is because I'm not letting him use his legs. So what the pitcher really does is the pelvis starts the rotation, but the back foot being on the ground is pushing into the ground. And now you've got the hamstrings and some hip rotators that are actually helping the pelvis rotate in the direction in which the pitcher is pitching. So right in front of the pelvis, on the, like if you, like in this picture here, right above where the pocket would be on the right side, there's some muscles that are help moving that pelvis into rotation. But if he wanted to go further, he'd have to be using his leg. So you'd have to see a different position. That's why the pitcher can get that pelvis all the way around. But if you don't understand pure pelvic rotation all by itself, you're not going to be able to teach it with the leg. So this is a great way to have them do this. So does that make even more sense, Joe? Yes. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. Okay. So I am so passionate about rotation. I think most of you know that when I was in graduate school, my graduate project was on the lower body and rotation. And, you know, there have been scientists that have actually studied this. And we know that about 50 plus percent of the velocity is created by these movements here. And there's scientists that have studied this by sitting a pitcher in a chair and not letting him use his lower body and figuring out what segments contributed what. I was so intrigued by rotation because nobody talks about it that I wrote an entire book on it. And I'm so fascinated, even with my own book that I wrote. It was one of the first products that I ever uh, developed. And it's because I felt like this information needed to get out there. So I have a special thing that I want to offer all the listeners. So first of all, the book that I have out, it's on my website. It's a digital download book. It has a live drill in there. The book is called Pitching Velocity, What to Do and How to Do It. And the skill that you'll learn in there is pelvis and trunk rotation. The table of contents, I have to tell you, uh, when I look at it, I am happy with the work that I did because it's thorough. It not only teaches about how this produces the velocity, but it teach, it has a drill that I call pitching on your back. And it's a live drill built into the PDF where you see a pitcher on his back like this, but he's actually in a pitching position. And you actually can see all the segments going into full rotation. It's something you can teach your guys how to do. I also have a section in there on how to troubleshoot problems like stride problems, like this problem, that problem. There's guidelines for how to develop your own exercises and drills. And for science people, anybody out there who has a science background, there's a complete section on the kinesiology of rotation, which is a lot of words that unless you understand uh, kinesiology, you won't understand. But I wanted to also make this a good tool for anybody uh, who's a physical therapist or an athletic trainer or somebody with a background. So the book is fantastic. And it's a $47. But for my listeners, there's going to be a special sale that I want to give to everyone. So Joe, make sure you write this down too. So the coupon code, if you go to my website, go ahead and buy the book. And when you get to the part where you're going to get go to PayPal, before you do that, in the coupon code area, you put in the word rotation, and it has to be all capital letters, all uppercase, rotation. And if you go and do that as of today, when this 
podcast is published, it'll be $27. And so there's my little gift to all of you for listening and also hopefully to inspire you to pay attention to this piece, which if this piece isn't happening, the reason why it's not happening is causing other things to happen. And if it's not happening correctly, it's diminishing the pitcher's performance. It's all about the way the pitcher converts his stride into rotation to face his target to throw. If that middle piece isn't done right, the rest isn't going to be as good as it could be. So what do you think, Joe? Wow. I think that's really amazing. I think uh, a very nice gift for the listeners. It's not even Christmas. I know. Well, I have to say thank you somehow. And when I started ta- uh, deciding to talk about this next trouble shooting velocity issue, I said, you know what? I want people to have this book. It's a great little book. And of course, whenever you buy any of my products, if you have any questions or anything, you can always call me. So anyway, um, so that's it for the teaching moment. And I hope uh, everyone learned something. Yeah, I, I definitely learned a lot. That's, uh, that's great stuff, Angel. Well, now that we've gone through the pelvis and the trunk, I think we should just keep moving right down to the ground and talk about the feet. What are you going to be talking about in our (laughs) pearls section? I know. And actually, this kind of, in some strange way, connects up with something I was just saying. But uh, believe it or not, the ideas came separately. So everyone knows that I'm on the field all day long working with pitchers and troubleshooting things. And there's an amazing thing that I have said to some pitchers about their feet, you know, because the feet are so important that and and they're critical in a lot of errors that occur in the motion and in a lot of different sports is because of the feet not doing what they're supposed to do. But whenever I teach this, pitchers look at me like, wow, and then they get it right away. And it has produced the most amazing things, particularly when you see something that's off in the way the body the the pitcher is holding his body when he's on balance or the way he falls off his front foot when he follows through. And so I want to talk about the feet and want to teach something about the feet that's really, really critical. And it happens to actually be something important to know if you want to do correct pelvic rotation. But if everyone, ha- it, when you have an athletic shoe on, you would just want to look down and The most important part of the foot that you have to understand when you're an athlete is the power or strength part of the foot. And that is the part that's right underneath where all your shoelaces are at. The reason why it's so, the foot is so strong in that area and why we consider it the strength part of the foot is because the bones there are long. They're like the length of the shoelaces. So, When a bone is longer, it's got some stability, particularly because when you have something like a hand, that's why the bones in your palm are long, because you've got a lot of bones at the end that are small and short, and they have to because the toes have to do a lot of things. But we don't want to have the middle of the foot being able to do too much. So you're always going to have a lot of little bones, then you're going to have underneath it a long or below it a longer bone. And then you've got the ankle, which again, has to move around and do a lot of things. So the middle part of the foot is critical. So when a pitcher is having a problem with his follow through, or let's say he's on balance, he lifts his knee up, And, you know, coaches, you guys are great at this. You'll be like, he's leaning back. He's doing this. You know, that's something you can see where he looks completely strange, particularly youth pitchers, when he's got at the top of his knee lift. And normally that's because the foot, the way it's on the ground when you're walking is completely balanced. It's relating to the horizontal plane of the earth. It's keeping you standing. When a pitcher goes up on one foot, if he shifts his weight out of that strength part of the foot and he goes into the heel, which is wobbly, it's supposed to be, or he shifts forward into his toes, which they sometimes do when they start to swing their left leg out if they're a right-handed pitcher, you will have a foot that loses its 
footing. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> Continue. I swear I didn't plan that. <laughs> no, that's that's the truth. <laughs> Well, I don't know another way to say it, but anyway, when he moves his weight forward into his toes because he's swinging his left leg out and so his body weight goes forward, that foot loses its ability to stay connected to the ground in an important way. And it needs to be connected to the ground because one, he's actually not going front to back with his body. He's going towards the plate. So that foot has to kind of stay down so his ankle can move him off the back foot. If he goes into his toes, he bypasses the ball of the foot, which is the part of the foot that's going to, and connect this with what you just learned, it's going to push into the ground and rotate the leg and help the pelvis to get all the way square. So the back foot is critical. Let's say he looks good on the back foot, but he lands with his front foot. And let's say he's doing what we talked about last week. Let's say he lands on his heel. Well, if he lands on his heel, we know his body weight has to move forward towards the plate to get over the foot. You can't just be on the heel, right? Because the backside of his body's coming around. So let's say he lands on his heel. He starts to transfer weight into the middle of his foot to his strength part. But because he landed on his heel his and he's in motion, he can't maybe figure out, oh, okay, now I'm in the middle of my foot. Perfect. I'll stay here. No, he goes into the toes. He just like, boom, goes forward. And then you'll see the pitcher who right at release goes into his toes. He's tilting over. His follow through will be the sloppiest thing you've ever seen. And all of that instability creates a problem for the release point because while it looks like he released and then he fell, his body was actually out of balance before he even released. So when you are in the back foot and then you get to the front foot, you have to understand the foot must stay stable. That's why we want pitchers to land in a way that allows their ankle to get into the right place so the foot can be stable. If you start going up on your toes, whether it's the front or the back, you're going to be in trouble. If your weight's in your heel, you're going to be in trouble too because eventually that foot's got to come down and it's going to create problems for, guess what, rotation. Back leg not acting right, you can't rotate completely. If the front foot isn't acting right, You can't release the ball exactly where you want it to. You're actually doing a balancing act at the moment when you really want to be doing all the crazy, gorgeous, cool things that pitchers can do with that ball. You won't be able to because your front foot never had its footing. Sorry, it's the only way I can say it. You are out of balance. So my pearls for this week are take a look at the feet. Wow. See, who knew the feet were so important? I mean, I, I always thought they were important because I have big feet. So I figured there was something <laughs> important about that. But um, Great. And we're all happy to know that yeah, now. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting, amazing stuff, Angel. Yes. Well, that's why it's called Pearls. <laughs> It's my it's it's my time to get to uh, pull in all the little crazy little topics that I think about all week. And I'll say something in a picture. His eyes will open up and I'll say I, I'll say, you know, while I think everybody knows that. No, I don't think everybody does know that. I think I'll talk about that this week. There you go. So anyway, there you go. And as Casey Kasem might have said, uh, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for home plate or the stars or something. Who is Casey Kasem? Who's Casey Kasem? American <laughs> top 40? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Am I the only okay. one that's aren't that we, old? Aren't we entertaining today? <laughs> okay. So, hey, everybody, buy my book. You will love it. Yes, absolutely. And that, that pretty much wraps up our show. And Angel, I, I think we covered quite a bit. If uh, anybody has any questions or ideas for or topics for a future episode, please send an email to Angel, angel at gymscience.com. Uh, more importantly, take advantage of the gift that Angel has provided you. 
head over to gymscience.com. It's gym as in G-Y-M-S-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. That's the website for Angel Borelli Pitching. You want to go to the products page and you want to move down to the third product, which is the velocity book, that pitching velocity, breaking it down to the skill that Angel was talking about. It's $47, but for you, it's only 27. Thank you, Angel. So put in the coupon code ROTATION. And for those of you that need a little help, <laughs> R-O-T-A-T-I-O-N. And if it's still too difficult, please check the show notes. We'll have a link there in the show notes. So don't forget it's all uppercase, everyone. All uppercase. So uh, because it's very important, bold uppercase. Okay. So that's it for this week. We'll be back again in two weeks. And in the meantime, we wish you safe and effective performance on the pitching mound.